their side. Their Facebook. Yeah. And then I think it'll. Yep. Boom. Just making things happen. Totes, bro. Okay, ready? I think. Let's just go and see Let's what just happens. Let's see. Just, yeah. Warning. The Catholic Man Show contains high levels of manliness. If you think you may be too weak to withstand the manliness represented in the following program, please do yourself a favor and stop listening now. If you choose to continue in spite of this warning, if at any time you feel yourself overcome by the manliness, stop immediately and consult your closest medical professional. And now, for the not-so-fair, faint, or frilly, we present The Catholic Man Show. Welcome to the Catholic Man Show. We're on the Lord's team, the winning side, so raise your glass. If this is your first time listening to the Catholic Man Show, this is a radio show slash podcast. If you're listening on the radio, make sure you go check us out on our or on our website, thecatholicmanshow.com. You can also check out while you're there the pilgrimage that we're going to be going on in September to Ireland with Father Sean Donovan that is quickly approaching. Yeah. I'm actually going to Ireland even before that here in a couple weeks. That's awesome. So I'll, I'll get to know the lay of you're the gonna land. You're going to preview the, the, whole, the whole thing for us. Right. And that way I don't know. No, no, no. Let's not go there. Let's go over here. Yeah. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so if you are listening on radio, uh, make sure you go check us out on thecatholicmanshow.com. We are without Juan again this evening, and without Jim, but uh, we're going to manage. We're recording on a Friday. That's a little just unusual all sorts for of us. Uh, things that are against tradition. Yeah, Juan and his bride are in Costa Rica for their uh, for their anniversary, not their honeymoon, but right. Uh, it's it's been a, a a tough week here in Tulsa. Uh, we're we're recording mm-hmm. on Friday because um, we were planning on recording on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, we had the the, the shooting in, that happened at St. Francis Hospital, and because I'm the communications director of the diocese and the hospital is a Catholic hospital, um, I had some other things I had to get take care of today. Yeah. So or on Wednesday, on Wednesday, and yesterday, and today, it's been a it's been a hectic week. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So pray for all those who uh, the four that lost their lives and the gunman the who five. lost yeah. yeah and the gunman who lost his life and the families who are mourning the loss. It's been a it's been a tough week for Tulsa. Yeah. So um, I was very proud of our bishop, though. You know, uh, it happened, and Bishop made his way to uh, the hospital immediately. He was there right away, uh, along with several diocesan priests and uh, the Sisters of Mercy. So it was really great to have to to, sh- to be a public uh, figure. You know, to show in a public way the support yeah. and, and being able to be pastoral to those in need um, immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, so. And, you know, like St. Francis being a, a Catholic hospital, they were able to have mass. Uh, Correct. That was at the ne- I think it's the next day for the victims and their families. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then we we had a, a, a rosary at 3 p.m. today uh, all across the Diocese of Tulsa. And then um, on Saturday, if you're listening to this, this would be uh, live, this would be tomorrow, but uh, on Saturday they're hosting a communal prayer service at the cathedral and inviting all uh, all people to, to join at, in, 7. at 7 p.m. So... Um, I'm 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 it, it, I'm proud to work for the diocese. I'm proud to be a part of the diocese because uh, I feel like that in a tragic moment, um, the the leadership, uh, the leadership here in Tulsa is is using it to to try to bring people together to be pastoral to those in need, um, and to be able to to remind people to turn 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 to Christ because yeah. that's what we need. So. Um, every day, every day, every minute, every second. In the good times and in the bad times. That's right. So and in the middle times. Even the middle. Sometimes the middle times, the middle times yeah. don't get uh, thought of enough. Right. Those too. Um, so anyway, so tonight, if this is your first time listening to the, to the show, we we typically have a drink. We start off with a drink and, and enjoy uh, the fine things in life, such as a, a drink with a friend. 
And then we talk about either a gear. This evening we're going to actually talk about something to an action uh, to take. We kind of switch, kind of going back and forth between gears and, and actions to do. And then we, we haven't actually done a gear in a while, but I have, I have some some good man gear coming up. Coming up, good. Yeah. And then we talk. Then we have a conversation. We just have a, a just a conversation between uh, friends. Talk, talk about virtue. Really, this show is about living the virtuous life. Yes. And and different ways to do that, as a Catholic man, in 2022. Right. Dave and I have been best friends since we've been about five years old, and yep. so uh, we live across the street from each other now. And uh, run the, the Catholic radio station here in Tulsa, and uh, started this podcast radio show in 2016. Uh, so this evening we are drinking. This is an interesting one. It's a American whiskey. It's Old Elk. Uh, it is a straight bourbon uh, whiskey. It's also barrel proof. So get ready. Mm, all right. Um, it is uh, the liquor store here in Tulsa, Aspen Liquor. They bought a barrel of it, and this is their barrel. Now, Old Elk is is interesting uh, distillery because they pride themselves on a slow uh, alcohol proof uh, process is what they call it. you know so you know whenever they're proofing the alcohol they're adding water to the to the whiskey to to get the ABV where they want it to be right yeah, yeah. well uh, in big distilleries uh, big conglomerate distilleries they dump you know this is hundreds of thousands of gallons of water at a time and what happens whenever that when that process takes place is you, you you sometimes lose some of the 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 taste some of the uh flavors that are in the whiskey because there's so much water being dumped in at once um and it's okay. a little bit more inconsistent in in, yeah. in bottling and so old elk takes uh, yeah. does take, it all get mixed at just it, the right ratios right, when exactly. you're doing that much yeah it's hard it's hard for quality control but old elk takes uh, pride in the the very limited and slow process of alcohol proofing to make sure that it's exactly mm. where they want it to be. Uh, they they okay. say it's harder to obviously make production out of it, but uh, they they're very uh, very adamant that this is what helps make their whiskey what mm. it is. Uh, so the notes on on the whiskey you just tried it, but uh, the aroma is a sweet vanilla, caramel, spicy clove, slight maple, and a, a nutty almond. The taste is a, a maple syrup, almond, raw bran, uh, chocolate, deep wood, and coconut. Yeah, I get a lot of I get a lot of oak. Really? Yeah. It's like, well, wow, it's barrel that's, proof. So that's that is a lot of there's a lot of wood. Um, and then it's a smooth coating with a, a lasting flavor, a strong. Mm -hmm. a strong yeah, flavor. no, it's got a good finish. They also use four times the amount of mal malted barley as what most people do. So they, they you're, they're using uh, barley, rye, and corn. Ah, mm. you can taste the rye. When you say that, yeah, you can taste the rye. The rye probably gives it that a little bit of a, a little bite to mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I mm -hmm. like it. So uh, we're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. Cheers to Jesus. Cheers. Mmm. That's good. How old is it? Does it have an age statement? It does not have an age statement. Is it bonded? Does it say? It is not. So this is a, it's most likely a blend of different ages. Mm -hmm. um, how much was it? Well, this one was a little bit more expensive because it's, it's barrel proof. It's I mean, barrel proof, and right. it, and it was a specific barrel that was bought by a liquor store here in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. I think it was about seventy five dollars. Okay, so um, I really want to join the uh, Malt Whiskey Society. Is that what it mm -hmm. is? Mm -hmm. uh, my brother in law Drew. He's he is a member now, and every time I go over there, he's got new bottle, a, a new yeah. bottle or two. You can't get you can't get or or you can, but um, you can't. All of theirs are barrel proof. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything that you get through from them is barrel proof, and so it's just really interesting to say, oh, I've had this whiskey, but it didn't taste like this. You right. know, like this is the full it's packs of punch. Like this is full on. You the flavor is just so much more because they're not watering it down. I mean, that's right. what they do. If you buy, you know, you go and you get a whiskey that's 80, 80 proof, you know, in that range, they're just taking it out of the barrel and watering it down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they can sell a lot more bottles that way. Sure. And it's also more palatable for most right. people. Right. And exactly. That's, that's, it's not just about selling more. It's about creating a product that has the right, uh, you know, balance for the average whiskey drinker. Mm -hmm. 
I prefer strong this flavors, is, this right? This is so. much different than the Willet we had last week uh, with Deacon uh-huh. uh, Garlic. You know, that, that Willet was so smooth, but it was also very uh, sweet. Yeah, it was. I really like that. Mm-hmm. But, it, but this, this is mu- much more this packs has, a punch. I mean, it does have a lot more uh, r- raw flavor to it. You, mm-hmm. Can you taste the wood? I mean, that was yes. the first thing that jumped out at me. He's like, wow, that's got some oak. Mm-hmm. So Old Elk, they're out of uh, Colorado. Um, go check it out. I I I like it. I like it as a, as a bourbon. Or a, yeah, not a, a bourbon. American whiskey. American whiskey. Right. Bourbon. Yeah. I uh, also like it. Happy birthday, Adam. Thank you. Yeah. Adam is now thirty six years old. Thirty six years old. Thirty six years young. It's One a, foot in the grave. It is amazing. Yeah. Dude, you're gonna be forty so soon. I know. And I I still have a long way to go. You'll be you'll be thirty six uh, on the pilgrimage. In months. Right. It's months away. Three. like a lot so it's 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 a, it's a, a whole bunch of days have we talked also about that our kids got con- confirmed no i wanted to talk about that okay let's talk about that really fast like so elizabeth got uh received communion and got confirmed her first communion and and her confirmation and her first and confirmation for, and first confirmation <laughs> the confirmation right yeah and uh uh luke and jude both got confirmed and jude also received holy communion mm-hmm um, we're going to be doing some kind of trip. It was an awesome soon. day. I it mean, was, it was like, it was so, it was for so. our like s- small group of friends, mm-hmm. uh, like Henry, um, yep, my, Henry received first communion my nephew. Mm-hmm. and his confirmation. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't know who Henry is, he, you know, he's, he was born really, really early, you know, has a lot of challenges in life. Um, and so it's so exciting. But it's brought so many people to Christ. Oh, man. And Father was talking to him like, Henry, you know, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit today. And he just got this huge he smile. Grin on his face. Oh, uh, I almost cried when I it saw was, that. It was hard not to. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, anyway, it was just such an amazing weekend, a grace-filled weekend. Uh, when we get back, we're going to talk about something that we, that we pulled off. Also, that was really fun. I want to talk about it. It was awesome. All right, we'll be right back. Whoa. Almost breaking our stuff. You ready? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm going to turn. Yeah, it was one and three. Use, use was rat. Every once in a while. I'm proud of you. Okay, ready? Yep, let's do it. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles, here with Adam Minahan. And that's it. We're here all by ourselves. This is like the old days, Adam. Old days. <laughs> when we used to do this all by ourselves all the time. And now, like, we've grown lax uh, because yeah. I'm having to push these buttons, and it took us a little while to get it set up. You know, yeah, we I sat there and I said, "Is it? Did we set it? At, is it all ready?" And then we realized, no, it's not ready. Right. Right. But anyway, we're here. Um, we're drinking some Old Elk. Mm-hmm. Is that the distiller? There's a name here, Greg. Yeah, that's a, it's his dis- Medi- master distiller. All right. It's really good. I like it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thanks for bringing it to the table. So we wanted to, instead of talking about a man gear today, we wanted to talk about a community building action. And I got to give you props. I got to give you props. This is your idea. Not only was it your idea, you know, you're a big picture guy. I'm a big picture guy. You have ideas. I'm not the, I'm not a CEO. I'm a president. You, uh, but, but the execution guy. part of, of the ideas typically is not your. I like to, I like to have other people. I like to delegate. You're a very good delegator. I'm a delegator. You're a delegator. However, you had the idea, and then you also executed. And I you tried executed to do well. the. I try. I was gonna do the whole thing without telling you anything about it mm-hmm. until you just got an invitation on your door, right? Because I wanted to. It's like Adam is gonna be blown away that but I then, did all this. But then I had like the loca- but, the location was actually right outside your house, right. so <laughs> there were three people I actually had to ask permission, and you were one of them, right? So. So what you did, we had, we had a block party. A block a party. Neighborhood block party. It was so awesome. Yeah, so uh, when, you, when you told me this, I was like, this is a great idea. This is, you know, back whenever we were young, we knew everybody on our street, right? Mm-hmm. At least the families. I mean, you may not have seen them all or hung out with them all, but you at least knew, oh, we're the, that's the Johnsons, that's the Millers, that's the yeah. Smiths. Like, you just, you could name 
everybody on the, on your street. Yeah. And in today's world, for whatever reason, uh, at least in our in our area, I couldn't do that in my neighborhood. Oh no! But you know who can? Your kids. Right, because they're outside playing with them. They, kn- I was blown away. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I was like, let's have a block party. I've always wanted to like go to a block party, mm-hmm. and I realized, well, I'll just have to th- throw the block party. Okay. No one else is doing it, so I'm gonna have to do it myself. It's gonna be great. Um, and so. We planned it. Really? Uh, okay, let's let's start off. Like, how did you? So you, we blocked off a street. So what did you do? So well, we it's like I kept saying, "Oh yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it." And then finally, I said, "Okay, well, we got to do it. It's let's make it Memorial Day weekend, right?" And which was two weeks away at the time. Um, so the first thing you got to do, probably, to, to, I mean, uh, you got to check your local area, but you might need a permit mm-hmm. from the city. Um, in Broken Arrow, where we live, that was the case. But uh, the Broken Arrow people were great to work with it was so easy Mm -hmm. um they delivered roadblocks to my house um i just called them it was like an online thing to fill out it was no big deal Mm -hmm. um and so i submitted that got a permit got the roadblocks delivered um and then i just printed off invitations i just made online you know just online a invitation printed them off so it was like four invitations on each page Mm -hmm. cut them in you know cut them up and got your boys and walked around the neighborhood taping them onto doors. Mm-hmm. And th- that's when I when I realized when walking around the neighborhood with them, they kept saying, oh, so-and-so lives here. So-and-so lives here. And I realized, you guys know everybody. I mean, not everybody, but right. man, they knew 10 times as many people in the neighborhood as I do. Uh-huh. Because they are out playing with other kids, right? Right. Um, and have met the parents kind of through the course of events. Right. You know? <laughs> sure. Um. It was really great. Another thing that we did, which I think really helped, was we made a website. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like a big a, undertaking. A big undertaking, and I assure you that it is not. Mm-hmm. Um, you can go to oneandone.com. Mm-hmm. Not sponsored. Not sponsored. You can also go to GoDaddy. They do the same thing, but GoDaddy is going to charge you like three, like an extra $3. Um, it was like $4 to register the website. Um, the website I registered, our neighborhood is Fairfax. I registered fairfaxblockparty.com. Nice. Okay. And all I did, and then I created a Google form Mm -hmm. that is, uh, set up. They have a template on Google, Google forms. Right. That's a registration for a party. All I did was redirect, uh, Mm fairfaxblockparty.com to the Google form, Mm -hmm. which has a long, obscure website, which is why we didn't want to drive people to that. Right. Um, and so then they could go and say, yes, I'm coming. How many people, you know, ask him other questions. I had some other information on there, uh, like a screenshot of our neighborhood, like Google maps mm-hmm. where I highlighted, this is where it's going to be. It was just basic stuff, inviting him, letting him know. Um, and we got a couple, um, we got a sponsor, a guy who lives down the road from you has a, a business. He sponsored the keg, mm-hmm. which is really great. Top choice roofing. Shout out to Top Choice Roofing and Construction. Um, and then another guy who lives a few houses down from me is a, a musician by the name of Stephen Speaks, mm-hmm. um, which a lot of people have probably heard of. Um, he's like kind of a, he, especially back in the 90s when he was like early a- 2000s. Early 2000s. Early 2000s, thank you. Um, you know, like a Christian singer. And he's also put out some other- Singer, songwriter. Like not, not necessarily Christian songs, but right. um, good songs that have- uh, you know, pretty popular, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so he came and played music. Basically, we were in a bounce house for the kids. Yeah, through through cornhole, like I had a bunch of cornhole and things like that. For also, we had we had like uh, big bubble ma- or bubble machines for the kids. Mm-hmm. We had sidewalk chalk. We had uh, face painting. Face painting. Your wife did face painting. Face painting turns out is so easy. All you do is get hot water and and let take some colored pencils and let the tips of the colored pencil soak in hot water mm-hmm. and then you can just draw on on faces with them and it, it looks incredible nice i mean it was i didn't know that's how she did that's it. that's all we did so it's like you don't have to go get paint and practice about with a brush and stuff when you just have the colored pencils it makes it so easy yeah to actually do and that and we asked everybody you know to bring it aside if they that's to- and that's the thing is about getting community participation you don't have to it's not like one person has to organize everything right um, cause 
on the invitation i said hey bring a game if you want um and we had a couple people bring you know different things but yeah we had a few cornhole games we had the bounce house for the kids and somebody brought a big jump rope so the kids were able to jump rope that, together that, that was, was us we brought that oh you did that yeah okay i didn't know yeah but i know you had that big jump rope yeah dude sweet we have a big jump rope nice which doesn't actually isn't very good most of the time like most of the time you can't it's anyway um but it was awesome it was so much fun so we had there's 140 houses in our like little neighborhood we'd in our like section of the neighborhood that we were inviting and we had about 108 uh we had 108 register that they were coming and i think we had a few more than that mm-hmm. um come just to hang out yeah it, it was great because you got a chance to talk to people you got to see them face to face you also got a chance to meet uh, the parents of maybe some of the kids that mm-hmm. your kids are playing with, right? Which is very important, I think. Yeah, uh, you know, so that way you have a, a face with a name. I met I met a couple that I see at the gym all the time. I didn't know they lived in our neighborhood. In fact, they live four houses down from me. That's embarrassing. Well, I never see them. Yeah. Uh, four houses down. Four houses is a long way, right. you know. Yeah. Uh, but I see them, oh, like three times a week at the gym. You yeah. know, all the time. We um, also grilled a bunch of hamburgers. Yep. Um, and so it, it was great to also see the look on everybody's face whenever you said, okay, we're going to now pray mm-hmm. before before meal. Did you notice what I did? I basically did the bless us, O Lord, prayer, <laughs> except I just changed the words a little bit so it didn't sound like, to- bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. Yeah. I said, like, Lord, we ask you to bless us um, for the gifts that you've given us. Everything, you know, the food Our before family. us, everything you, we, is a gift from you um, that, you know, we're going to be receiving. Um, and we ask this through your, the name, through, the, you know, your son, Jesus. Amen. I mean, right. I was just trying to take that prayer and right. just make it a little bit more vernacular. Yeah. Uh, uh, but but it, it, it was just awesome. Like there was one moment where I was over, I oversaw where two people were talking and introducing and they said, oh, you're the new neighbor. And he said, yeah, I am. And I was thinking, this is why, this is it. This is the moment I wanted right here, you know. I invited a couple of people to church. You did? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I was, I had invited our pastor. He wasn't able to come. Right. Um, But. That would have been great. Yeah, so I, I I did invite him, but um, he just wasn't able to make it. I just think that it, uh, in today's world when we're, we're constantly being, you know, it's fast paced. Uh, we're, we're, we're on our cell phones a lot. Like we got to be more intentional about being on, not only outside, but being with uh, com- uh, the community, like having community events. Uh, right. And, and the, the normal modes of community in today's world have diminished mm-hmm. compared to, you know, back when we were kids, you know, everybody would, most people would go to church and that community would happen. Yeah. And uh, most people did have, you know, kids in sports or something like that, where you were, you would have that opportunity to have that community. And those are dwindling. Yeah. And it really was not hard to do. It was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. And especially if you get a couple neighbors, you say, okay, you're in charge of, um, like yard games, lawn games, Mm -hmm. you're in charge of activities for the kids, you know, and you don't need a lot. Mm -mm. Okay. You don't feel like, um, I was like looking up, oh, what, you know, best things to do at a block party. And there's just all the stuff about bike parades and like all these different activities where it was kind of like almost there was a schedule and, oh, at seven o'clock, we're going to do this. And at this time, we're going to do that. And, you know, that could be cool, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't have to do that. Right. Because the idea is to just get people together just so they can talk. Get them together so that the kids, first of all, you, you don't actually need to arrange things for the kids. It, they, like the kids will stuff. take care of themselves, right? right? And then just get people together, um, spread it out. You know, make it a community event where everybody brings a little bit to the table. And ultimately, whenever you do that, you you create you know friendships. You create right. uh, opportunities to evangelize. Amen. So it was really fun. I just well done. I'm I'm proud of you. Uh, July first uh, be a great opportunity for a block party. There you go. If, right. you, if you do it, send us a picture. That'd be awesome. We'll be right back. When 
if someone comments on Facebook, do they show up here somewhere? I don't think so. Jim just commented, hello. Hello, Jim. Oh, yeah, they do. Here they are. Nice. This is why we, we need one. Hello. 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 Hello, Jim. Okay. Are you ready? Do you have your notes and stuff? Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Welcome back to the Catholic Command Show. Drinking a little bit of Old Elk. Just got done talking about the epic block party that we threw. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, talk this evening about communication. Okay. You are the communication director for the Diocese of Tulsa in Eastern Oklahoma. That's correct. But I think as, as men in business, there's always opportunities to, to get better at communicating, right? Whether it's via email, whether it's you have to give a business presentation, whether you have to give a, a sure. talk at your, at your church, you know, whatever it is, uh, we always ha have opportunities to get better at communicating. And right, communicating more effectively. And efficiently. Effectively, yeah. efficiently, productively, mm -hmm. all those lees. Yes, all the adverbs. <laughs> uh, and so I was... <laughs> Mr. Communication Director, those are called adverbs. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. They describe a verb. Typically. Yeah. Always. I think always. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to go back through and, and review some old speeches, old uh, um, writings that were epic, right? And, and I wanted to see if obviously people have been dissecting good speeches. How, how are they good? Why are they good? You know what what makes them good how yeah. are they received mm -hmm. uh and there's there's a lady who who did her name is uh nancy duarte okay and she reviewed a lot she's she's a communicator she reviewed a lot of different speeches throughout history and thought okay there's a reason why they're good what makes them good and if there's a formula to make them good we should be able to watch or listen to multiple different speeches and they should overlap in a in a way of this is this is the formula that makes them good yeah something consistent something consistent and so she said uh she reviewed the i have a dream speech great speech and she also uh, reviewed uh steve jobs's speech of announcing the iphone okay two things you know two less familiar with that one but 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 both monumental okay yeah you know, obviously, the I have dream speech is much, much more. But uh, you know, King Junior. Anything he would say, he could read a terrible speech, but it would still sound really so awesome, right? And so, what what she said was the very uh, the underlying like consistent thing about these speeches is they they all started with here's the current situation, and then they would give a here's what it could be, and they would always try to make the current situation, and here's what it could be, have a, the biggest gap possible. So they would interesting. So they would talk about here's here's where we are, but here's what, if we did this, here's where, where where we could be. Uh huh. And then you'd hang out there for a little bit, and then you would come back to here's where we are again, and then here's where we could be, and you would go back and forth, volleying back between the present state. And then here's what the future could have. Like, here's where we could be if we if we could figure out the problem if we did this. You know, we, we, would, we would change the world if we did this. And here's how grandiose the, this, mm. this uh, future would be if we, if we achieved this, you know, this goal. Yeah. And it would volley okay. back and forth, back and forth. And then it would end on this strong call to action in the for the future. So the strong, like, here's what we, so now it's the battle, it, it, it's the battle cry. It's like, let's go into battle and, 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 and with fortitude and change the world. Yeah. And so she did this and she overlapped all these speeches. She did, a, it was really interesting because she, she overlaid, she made these peaks and valleys of, of here's the speech. And if you overlay them and, and you make these peaks and valleys and you, and you see, see them side by side, 
they're almost they're very very consistent. Really? Yeah, very comparable. And so it was just very interesting that this is how a lot of the communicators, uh, you know, in, in the last at least hundred years, have been communicating. And so then I said, okay, well, well, if that's how they're, you know, if that's how they were, they they have been doing it. How did they used to do it before you were able to give, you know, graphics and uh, PowerPoints, which is the death of of all <laughs> of all speeches. Yeah. But um, you know, how, before they had these visual uh, stimulants that you could uh, use in your speeches, how did they used to do it? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that Deacon Harrison Garlic gave me when I first became a, uh, the communications director, which I was very grateful for, was his notes on uh, Cicero when he's talking about uh, how he gives speeches. Um, because his rhetoric. He, he is like the greatest speech giver of all, all times. Time. Right. And so uh, it was very, it was, it was really great to be able to go through it because, and, and then I tried to, um, I was reading through the book. Book one and book two of this. Uh-huh. I think it's four books, but book one and two, uh, to 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 understand how did he used to do it? How did he captivate? Mm-hmm. How how is he throughout all of time still the the model of communi- effective communicating, mm-hmm. effectively communicating? And so he, he he used there's three branches basically of rhetoric, which is very like um, Christian as well. Yeah, I mean let's just say, let's just stop and say that there used to be like a category of study called rhetoric. Mm-hmm. You know, th- that would be Go something be. that people, if you were educated, then you would study rhetoric. Uh, but this idea of how to present your ideas persuasively, eloquently, you know, in a way that would convince other people. Right. Um, and we don't do that anymore. No, that, I mean, that's the classical uh, education uh, when, when you go through uh-huh. that is, is making a revival. Uh, but but think about how important that is because persuading hasn't that's not like that's out of style, you know. We still today need those skills just as much as ever mm-hmm. about hey, I'm going to present my side of the issue in a clear way so that people understand what I'm saying, they understand what I'm not saying, mm-hmm. um, con- concisely so it doesn't take me forever, right? I don't lose people's attention. Mm-hmm. Um, we should bring it back. We got to bring it back. Well, that's why we're trying to homeschool and trying yeah. to do trying Classic, to do that classical stuff. Classical stuff. The classics. Um, so he, he talks about that there's three branches of rhetoric: the the ethos, the pathos, and the logos. I like the last one. Yes. Um, and so, uh, you know, the logos being uh, logic, reason. The eth- uh, etho- uh, ethos is is appealing to to authority. The you know the uh, okay. cre- credibility of of uh, of the author, uh, ethical aspects of of your speech, and then and then the pathos is obviously like the emotion, like appealing to to emotion. And so Cicero uh, basically gives five different canons of rhetoric. Uh, here, here, five canons? Yeah, that's that's what he calls it. And this is what I like think categories. Is that what? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, like categories. And this is what I think. Uh, if you are preparing a speech, if you're preparing. Uh, maybe even writing a book or, or, or you're, you're preparing like a long email that you have to write, something like that. This is what I think this is a, a, a good blueprint for you. Okay. So he, he breaks down into five things, invention, arrangement, expression, memory, and delivery. Now, this is obviously for a speech, but I think you can also utilize this uh, in other aspects as well. So invention is like, so you, you, you put all your ideas together that, that could possibly, that could be plausible to what you're trying to convey. Put them all together. And this is... Uh, Really good if you have like a whiteboard or something like that in your office. So this is like the content, sort yeah, of. Yeah, this is kind of like brainstorming, trying to get everything out. Okay. And then he says you got to arrange it. So you arrange it in a in a fitting, proper order. Okay, so right. like you have all your ideas, you have your brainstorming ideas. Okay, now that, now now that I have those, I need to break it down into what steps. A, yeah. Into a fitting order that's right. that makes a logical sense. Uh huh. And then expression meaning like how do so at this point how do I verbalize this how do i communicate this to to other people so am i going to be more appealing to the emotion side when am i going to be appealing to emotion right when am i going to be appealing to uh, uh logic when am i when am i going to be appealing to authority and, and so you, you 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 have the understanding of when you're going to do that throughout the speech uh-huh. and then it, then it's memory so it's it's saying like you have a, a firm mental grasp of of what the 
the speech looks like, the pa- the the picture that you're painting, like how uh, how is it going to flow? You have it you have it memorized. Like I don't think he he really means not like memorized, memorized but just understanding the understanding the flow of the content. Mm-hmm. Although he may have memorized, you know, the, back in the day they used to memorize all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. It was just a skill that they were more practiced in doing. Right. And then he said, and then he talks about the delivery aspect, which the delivery is, is the most important, important part. Right. It's all of those things put together. Right. It's almost like that Seinfeld episode when he, when he says, y- you can hold the reservation. No, you, you can, can take, take the, reservation, the reservation, but you, you can't, can't hold the reservation. And really holding the reservation is the most important, important yeah. part. Uh, so he says like the delivery aspect of this is, is, is very important. This is like understanding who your audience is. Does he say to pound on the table? Like Dwight Schrute. Yeah, like Dwight Schrute. Uh, he did not shake your hands shake in hands the air. He d- they do use a lot of uh, uh, motion in in their speech giving, uh, but uh, understanding your audience is, is very important. In fact, he he was talking. He, he talked about how now, this is not something that I recommend doing, but he talks about how emotion is the most important part. If you can appeal to emotion, facts totally facts do not matter. Mm-hmm. You just got to appeal to emotion. I mean, if you want to convince somebody. You appeal like, to emotion. Really, if you want to, if you want to convince the average person, just fill your speech with logical fallacy after logical <laughs> fallacy. They are <laughs> they are so persuasive. You know, like and people can't can't like, see them. Just go ad hominem. You know, poisoning the well. Just like just keep dropping them. You know, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Yeah, and just one after the other, and you will just absolutely <laughs> convince most people. Right. Yeah, so he uh, he would he would like even Cicero would give like speeches, and whenever he was giving speeches or or, or uh, even like in trials, he would bring the person up, which was not common that time. It's like not how it is in, in today's uh-huh. law. Look at him, but look at him. Like, how could you think this man? Look at this man. Right. Um, what a brilliant, what a brilliant move. So he used pro- he used a lot of pro- props, meaning like mostly people uh-huh. or statues he used Jupiter as one like a new sculpted Jupiter was there and he's like how could we be defaming Jupiter here today you know with <laughs> this conversation uh-huh. you know in, in his statue so anyway we'll, we'll, we'll keep this conversation going on the other side of the break we'll be right back Just, I mean, at your leisure. I'm ready. Okay. I'm mostly ready. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah, sure. (laughs) Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles here with Adam Minahan. We're talking about Cicero and his rhetoric. Yeah, his approach to rhetoric. Which I'm guessing he pioneered. I mean, he actually wrote down a lot of these things. So he was so good at it that people wanted to know mm-hmm. his steps, his method. Yeah, he gave a blueprint. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let me ask you this. So whenever you have to uh, write an email to to your boss or to, uh, to an important client, mm-hmm. uh, do you have a system that you use when you're, write, when you're writing emails? Um... You know, not really because um, I'm more of a phone call guy. Like, I have phone calls with clients all the time. Mm-hmm. My emails are typically following up from a phone from a conversation. From a okay. So it's I'm not laying out new information. You know, okay. I'm maybe hey, you know, I, you know, I was said I was going to get back to you about this one thing. You know, here I looked mm-hmm. into it, whatever. So they're usually very short. Okay. Um, well, when so I was going, no, yeah, the, not really. When I was going through and I was listening, or I was reading uh, what Sister says about the five canons of rhetoric: invention, arrangement, expression, memory, and delivery. I actually was somewhat pr- pleasantly surprised because it made me think of how we write our speech, uh, we write our talks. Like when we go out and give talks to, at, at men's conferences or or or, or, or other, you know a variety of conferences, we actually uh, unknowing 
about this, at least for me, we, we really do this. Uh, how we write talks, Dave, is you and I, we, we'll get together uh, and we say, okay, what's this talk about? It's about fatherhood. Okay. Now, what do we want to convey about fatherhood? Yeah. And then you and I just start- Broad to specific, right. baby. We just like start throwing broad, out ideas. Broad to specific. Definitions. So let's start with some definitions. Right. So we, we you know, we, we, you know, throw out all these ideas and then we arrange it and say, okay, so- if we're talking about fatherhood, so what does a father do? But he pr protects, provides, and establishes. Okay, so those should be, you know, a system that we use. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, then we kind of throw in the expression aspect of like, okay, well, here, you, you know, you, you can throw a joke in here. I'll throw a joke in later. Uh, you know, and then we, we, we rehearse it several times to where we understand where we're going to go. And then we deliver it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was, I was really actually kind of impressed. In the last few times we rehearsed it, it's gets to be where it's okay pretty much the same right and at this point you know we've done enough times where we kind of already know how it's gonna go right but that's how we write i mean that's how we uh -huh. write our talks um right and so i was, I was actually looking through that and be like sweet we do not script a talk no we bullet point. we bullet point a talk mm -hmm. but it ends up being kind of scripted because we've run through it enough times and we understand each other it's like all right you do this bullet i do the next bullet mm-hmm and we end up saying kind of the same thing and mm -hmm. finding a groove mm -hmm. that works. Uh, one of the things that Cicero really talks about also is like when, you, when you're starting, find common ground with your interlocutor. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that, that uh, Deacon Garlic told me, like when uh, gave me advice when I first started as a communications director, you know, th there's a lot of things that you have to do. You have to write press releases. You have to... Uh, you know, email different people who may be disgruntled about the church or, you know, you, there's a lot of different situations where you have to find common. It's kind of tough to find common ground. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times you're, you're in the right, they're in the wrong. And all you want to do is just blast them for it. Right. You know, and, and, uh, list the reasons why quit, they're wrong. Quit wasting my time with your petty complaint. Right. But, uh, you know, that's not what, we, that's, that's not how you, you gain. Yeah. You know, it's not how you bring people closer to Christ. Yeah, altar rails are great. Okay, I don't know why you're you're sending me an email complaining about them. <laughs> that didn't happen, but uh, yeah, I'm making that up. But right. if that would happen, I could hypothetically see that happening. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he told me he said, okay, so when you start an email or when you start a talk or anything else, find common ground. You always start and end in a positive situation, a positive tone, even if. It's a negative thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sort of like the power of the positive yes. Yes, very, very much so. Uh -huh. You know, you start off. So, you, when you're think about it, when you're writing a business, you know, your one of your coworkers is just giving you, you know, grief, and uh, you guys are not on the same page. But you're you need to write this email to to your you know your team. You start off by by finding something positive. Like, yes, I agree that we all need to make sure we complete this mission. We all need to complete this project. Mm -hmm. And I think we all agree that we all want to complete this project. And then you list very specifically where the, either the differences are or where, where we're on the same page. Yeah. So that way it's very laid out, artic you know, articulately understanding bullet point by bullet point. Here's where, we're, here's where the differences are. And then end, make sure you're ending the email or ending the conversation or with positive with, again. with a positive again. So I think that if we get, if we can get through these bullet points that we can, we can make this thing happen. Yeah. And so then I thought, Oh, that's exactly, you know, how the, the speeches that were written that we talked about earlier in the last break, that's very similar to how they start off. They, they, they write these speeches, mm -hmm. you know, they, they have the current situation. Then they, if we if we can, if we can accomplish this, then think about where, where we would be. Mm -hmm. But here we are, and but if we yeah, so those if, are the differences. If we overcome this hurdle, then we could be we could be uh, here in the future. We could be uh, c completing this project, you know, or landing this client or whatever it is. Yeah, and going back and forth, back and forth to what is right now and what could possibly be. Uh, and that was just something when it, when he was chatting with me about it, uh, I, I really appreciated. And that was something that's beneficial. It's like very common sense, but if you if you're not used to maybe writing emails, if you're just not maybe starting the workforce and you don't, you know, maybe, maybe you haven't had that much experience with it. It, it was very good advice. Mm -hmm. Is there a, um, a book or something about this or like a essay that someone has put together about the, about Cicero's approach here that 
Because oh, you, you sure said these are Deacon's notes, but you don't know if it's like. Well, this is his notes on 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 Cicero's book. This is his notes that okay, he made. Okay, so actually, it's on Cicero. So the book. The book, yeah. Where Cicero put out this. Yeah, a day invention. It's like the invention is what it's called. The invention. The invention by mm-hmm. Cicero. Mm-hmm. Day. I hope you read Latin. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, like I, I thought that was very uh, beneficial in, in mm-hmm. a. In, and not only so then i thought okay that's very beneficial in the professional realm but then i thought this is the art of of rhetoric even in the christian world you know um when you're you're talking to somebody who's not catholic you got to find common ground first you you like mm-hmm. you're talking to a protestant it's like yes we both believe that jesus christ is our lord and savior and that uh you know yeah. the bible is the holy writ- word of god good we're on the same page there. Mm-hmm. Now, here's where we're not on the same page. But if we got on the same page, then we would all would be part of the one body of Christ that, that Jesus prayed right before he took his uh, entered into his passion, that we would all be one. And so, but right now, here's where we are because we here's our differences in the Eucharist, in confession, in the you know the variety of sacraments and the hierarchy, whatever it is. But if we didn't, you know, if we we came together there, think about how we would set the world on fire baptizing all the nations in the name mm-hmm. of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, like Jesus asked us to do, like commissioned us to do. Yeah. You know, and so I, then I started thinking, like, how many times have I missed that opportunity when I'm talking to people about the, the Catholic faith? Because I was too tempted to say, like, here's the seven reasons why you're wrong. Mm-hmm. And then and then list all seven, you know, and then be like, because of this, because of this. And list them as forcefully as possible. Right, yeah, and just beat them. And, you know, yeah, over hammer. Here. Yeah, take and, that. And so, I just thought I was. I, I just was reflecting upon the times that I I used uh, my rhetoric poorly to evangelize, and then also obviously times where I used rhetoric poorly in business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that it's a lot different today because obviously when Cicero was was doing this, everything was oral. And, uh, you know, you were given time to give a speech, right? Mm -hmm. And then somebody else would give us, you know, a counter speech or something. Mm -hmm. And giving a speech is a total, you know, the medium is the message. And in a speech, you can have pauses. You can modulate your voice. You know, are you angry? Are you compassionate? Mm -hmm. Are you sad? Are you happy? You know, like those things do not come through in an email. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you have to change, you know, obviously all that has to change when you're writing. Right. Um, and knowing your audience is key there. Totally. Yeah, totally. Because you can't like, you, you know, you, there's no, um, sarcasm font. Right. Uh, I know like people have talked about making one. We sh- I would totally be down for a sarcasm font. Right. If we, if we come up with one, yeah. Right. But um, so you have to you can't just take these principles and boom, put them into an email uh, because that's not it's a different message. Right. You know, um, well, one thing one thing that I really I, I really enjoyed. I, I have ma- the, the master class. Have you heard of these? You know, the master class yeah, yeah, yeah. series and uh, Kev, uh, his name is Voss. I think it's Chris Voss. Chris Voss. He's a. a professional negotiator he's done all these negotiations with hostages and things like that and he gives this what a crazy job oh it's incredible it's gonna be incredibly stressful but he 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 talks about how it's some of his tactics that he uses and i i use them to this day Mm -hmm. when somebody is talking they're telling you about something that you're not really sure how to answer you're not sure how to respond you need actually more time to think Uh uh-huh uh they'll finish a sentence and it's it's called mirroring mirroring tactic Mm -hmm. so you basically repeat the last three or four words that they say kind of in a question form so like say something like you talk about look i need a thousand dollars you need a thousand dollars that's what i said and then like you just stop and pause and it because of the communication they feel like oh well i guess i gotta keep explaining why i need a thousand dollars uh-huh you know, and so th- then they go on and say, "Well, yeah, I got I need the thousand dollars because I got a, a car payment to pay." You have a car payment? Yeah, I don't own the car. This is about your car. Yeah, and so y- you know, you just kind of mirror what they're talking about, and it gives you not only time to think about, you know, how you're going to approach, but it also gives emotions the opportunity to, to yeah. settle down. You got to be careful down. though. 
Because sometimes <clears throat> someone might think, are you mocking me? You know, like, no, but, yeah, mean, you can't do it in, too much. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, you can't just over and over and over again. But it gives you time to utilize. So when we, uh, if you're listening on the radio, go check us out on the podcast. We'll continue this conversation um, over there on the podcast. We're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. Cheers to Jesus. Cheers. But I use I, I actually use this very uh, very often. There's another type of mirroring mirroring that I'm familiar with, where basically you just adopt the attitude and disposition of your interlocutor. Right. Right. Yeah. Where oh they're crossing their arms, I'm crossing my arms. You uh, play the Andy Andy Bernard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, but uh, that's a how am I gonna get out of, uh, out of this therapy? Uh, he says something like uh, mirroring everybody. You know. I forget his whole like, but he's basically like saying like, basically, I'm just gonna copy everybody, right? What he, what they're doing. If you're feeling good, I'm feeling good, right? You know, if you're complaining, so am I, right? Uh, and there, there is, I mean, it's been mirroring pro- personalities, and, right? It's know. been proven that if you do that with a person, they tend to like you, like, right? You know what? Something about this guy I just really like, mm-hmm. like, yeah, because he's just being you, you know? right? And, well, and, and you know, a lot of people just love to love to talk. Uh-huh. And so if you just allow them to and give them a little bit more of a reason to talk, especially on something that they, they're passionate about, right? So I, I I use this a lot whenever I'm speaking with academics or something, and I don't know really the, the subject very well. And they're talking about it, you know, a specific topic, and I use mirroring a lot. But I've practiced it enough to where it doesn't come off as I'm – you know, making fun of them, but more that I'm, I'm more interested in like, well, well, hold on. I don't really understand what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. And then they feel like that they have to keep explaining it. Right. This is a really good, um, like thing for a first date where, uh, people naturally have a tendency in conversation, especially if it's a one-on-one conversation to tell parallel stories. And, um, because, Oh, I have something about that. I can tell you, but it's actually a selfish thing to do and doesn't really progress like a conversation very well. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, if I ask you, you know, what'd you do first, whatever. It's like, oh, you tell me a story about going to a beach. And the first you have thing, a great beach the story. first thing is like, oh, I went to a beach one right. time. Let me tell you about when I was seven and I went to a beach, which actually has nothing to do with, you know, like if you're on a- Prudence uh, plays a big, a big role here. Right, if you're on a first date, uh, what you need to do is resist that temptation to tell your stories and ask questions about their story. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, try to talk about yourself very little on the first date. Mm-hmm. Not that like you're. Oh, I'm gonna keep. If they ask you, yeah, like if they ask you a question, you know, tell them. Right. But uh, you're not t- hiding information about yourself. But um, if you want that person to feel like you are an engaging person, a caring person, if you sit there and just ask them questions about, oh, no kidding, what was that like? Uh, you know. Had, you know, just ask them questions mm-hmm. about the things that they're saying mm-hmm. and get them to be the one talking all the time. They will leave. And this isn't ju- not just a first date, but um, conversations in general. Mm-hmm. If you, in your conversations, get the other person to do most of the talking, then they're going to walk away from that conversation going, man, that guy is awesome. Mm-hmm. Like, he's he's such a great guy. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is about him. I just, he, I just like that guy. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's very difficult in, in, in today's world is, is we're, we're really bad at regulating our emotions. We make the most mistakes when our emotions are high. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we regret our decisions of what we've done uh, when our emotions are high. And so using some of these, these tactics really give you the opportunity to temper your emotions uh, and make more prudent decisions. Yeah. One of the other things that I use a lot of times is is making sure that I understand. So if you, you if you if you tell me something, I kind of repeat what you say. So let me just make sure. I th- so I think what you're saying is, and then repeat what they're saying. Uh-huh. And so it get, just gives you more time, especially in a contentious conversation, because it makes the other person feel validated. Right. Like okay, yes. When they when you say what I'm hearing you say is this and this and this, and it makes you feel like this. When the other person says yes. That's exa- that is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. They feel good now that you, they feel understood. And they feel heard. Right, exactly. Um, that's definitely, they feel validated, mm-hmm. right, in their stance, whatever it is, even if it's totally wrong. Right. Um, at least 
they know that you've been listening. Right. And so I use, I use both of these things a lot. So I use mirroring a lot and I use the, so I think what, so are you saying this? Mm -hmm. Or, and if I want to be kind of persuade them, then I say, it seems like what you're saying is this. And I kind of lead them down this, mm -hmm. this road to make sure. But it's also helpful because sometimes you think you understand what they're saying and, and then you not. realize you don't know what you don't understand what they're saying. Right. And, and you, you just it saves, you know, like the conversation was about to stall out. You know, you're going to respond in a way and you're going to end up wasting five minutes before you realize, oh, I thought you were saying something else. You know, right. absolutely. Another thing that's uh, something that my mom taught me uh, that I have carried on. Uh, she taught from I mean, she just hammered this into us when we were young. Mm hmm. Uh, and I've I've used it to this day is uh, kill them with kindness. Mm -hmm. It is very hard to be mean or aggressive towards somebody who is always nice to you. Right. And so and as Christians, you know, we're called to love everybody. This whole uh, understanding of like what love is and like how we're supposed to call be called to love everybody is like I think what that really means is just kill them with kindness. Yeah. Um it means like it doesn't mean like oh i'm gonna i love you i and i or i validate exactly what you're doing right it just means but, to be charitable but i'm just being charitable to you constantly like, like recognize all, their dignity all the time mm -hmm. and so uh i use that constantly of smiling like you know if you can try to be if smiling becomes part of your reality if smiling becomes part of of uh how you carry yourself it's very hard for people to be be mean to you it's very hard for people to be uh have something like an issue with you i think the evangelization really starts can can start with just a smile totally because it's how you carry yourself it's like there's something you know it's it's that whole uh peter uh first peter 3 315 like what's that hope that's within always be you? ready to give yeah an explanation for the hope that's within you it's like it's saying that they've already recognized there's some kind of hope within right. you right yeah i mean if you're if you're the catholic in the office but you're um, always grumpy or you're a Debbie Downer right I mean people are going to uh, trans like transpose you onto the things that are about you like oh he's Catholic he's totally the worst mm -hmm. but if you can always be you know and you can say like well that's just your disposition that's how you're that's your that's an excuse it's an excuse you can like you get to choose you have a free will you can choose to be happy you can choose to be right. have a smile there's no temperament that's just oh oh you're that temperament so you just get to be mean all the you know like you get to be in a bad mood right no you don't you even don't give me like i'm melancholic it's like get out of here right why well don't, why don't you like quit being selfish and i i have found that this a smile helps you be more grateful for everything that you know mm -hmm. uh the reality around you totally i mean so once again it comes back to your prayer life you know it's it's just so funny how your prayer life in the christian life uh living it it's almost like the oxygen always comes research. back to your prayer life right it's so it's like the oxygen if you have a good life right no totally if you have a good uh a strong prayer life then the worst thing can happen to you and you don't lose your peace over it you know because you're grounded Mm -hmm. And so you can maintain the, the right disposition in your day to day life, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the time, the worst thing's not going to be happening to you, right? And so you're going to be able, to, you're prepared, you're ready to have joy. People are going to see the hope, right? Um, and so, the, and it just in in the business world too, it just gives you a credibility. It does. I mean, it, it makes you more credible that, and people tend to go to you for uh, you know counsel. Because uh -huh. it's like, well, you seem you seem to be happy all the time, so let me figure out what you're doing. Right. And that gives you the opportunity to show, here's why I'm happy. It's because because I have Jesus. Right. I have a relationship well, with Jesus. If you want to know, right? There's a dude. He was the dude of dudes, and he loves you incredibly, and wants to have a relationship with you. Yeah. And so I I don't know. I just think that all the, none of the none of the things that we said tonight. A revolutionary, obviously. As well, they're typical. you know thousands of years old, right? <laughs> right. Um, but it's good to go back to the basics sometimes, mm -hmm. and and remember like, how am I carrying myself? Uh, am I smiling? Am I happy? How am I communicating to to other people? Am I, right. Am I effectively communicating? Do I have my ideas in order? You know, am I am I 
evangelizing the best I can. Like, how do I, like, how should I be doing this? Mm -hmm. Getting back to the drawing board. Um, and I just think that, you know, I think that if we do that, if we, if we take a step back, what are you doing? Think about it. Think of it. Stop what you're doing and, and think and think, stop and think of what you're doing. Yeah. But we need effective communication today. Like, I want to say more than ever. I haven't been around ever, but um, there are a lot of stupid ideas that are so popular. Right. I mean, d we're talking about basic fundamental things like a man. What is a man? What is a woman? Right. Like the fact that you have to be a biologist to have like you seen, uh, say the, what a uh, woman is. What like, is a woman? Have you seen that Matt, Matt Walsh documentary yet? No. He just he came out with this. Doc, I don't know if you know, are aware of this, but he just came out with a documentary. Uh, it's called "What Is a Woman," and he's go, he goes around all the world asking this question for people to answer. Yeah, and he interviews, uh, you know, all these people who have doctors who give. Dude, home, it's a mystery. Okay, we don't know what a woman is. Right. He, he's going to the women's marches. He goes over to Africa and like these tribal areas, asking them what is a what is a woman, and they give clear answers. He goes, "What if?" A man wants to be a woman and they look at him like that doesn't make sense like mm -hmm. it's like not computing what do you mean by this you know and uh so i mean he and he goes around all around the world asking people what is a woman mm -hmm. uh politicians all these things you know and it's just funny to see the reaction like we are to the point in this world where there are some who cannot will not or cannot define what a woman is and you know what's funny is that the people who won't define a woman, what a woman is, they're not stupid. They know exactly what a woman is. They know that they're just having to say this because of the agenda, right? Uh, it's just absolutely ridiculous that we have got to the place where we value this agenda. Right. More than just recognizing basic, like what could be more basic than like, this is a woman. This is a man, right? If you can't, if you can't say what a woman is and what a man is, then what can you say? Well, is there is there anything? Right. Are you alive? Right. I mean, it's like all of a sudden now it's you know just the uh, hermeneutic of suspicion for everything. We don't know. Uh, no, I, this the whole world might be dreamed up. I mean, it's just like great. Well, you just go live in fairyland. Right. It, it sometimes it makes me feel like you know what i'm not gonna argue with you i'm just gonna leave you to your own devices i'm like i'm gonna shake devices or vices yeah yeah very good i'm gonna just shake the dust from my feet and say like good luck if you need me i'll be over there in regular person world in the truth you know i'll just like the where, where, the, where i'll be set free because the gonna, truth sets you free i'm gonna be over there doing my thing like a regular person the thing the the, the fear is though that the crazies, it's not enough that you leave them alone, right? You have to be crazy too, right? Or we'll come for you. Or you're you become the crazy. You're canceled, right? They'll, you know, like anyway, it's not what we're talking about today. But I don't really have much. But we else. need good rhetoric so that we can. And we need to teach our, our children good rhetoric so they can uh, spot fallacies. So they can right. they can be able to to combat the, what the world's pushing mm -hmm. around. So. That's kind of, I don't really have Very much good. else. Do you Very have anything good. else you no. want to... You uh -uh. Wanna... No, indeed. No, indeed. No, indeed. It's positive, negative. <laughs> Start with a positive and end with a negative. <laughs> I guess it'd be a negative, positive, but it's both. Where we are, where we could be. Mm -hmm. All right. 